Okay, uh, welcome back. We're going to go over Nigel Short versus Stuart Conquest, take two, in, in round four of the British Championship. So uh, welcome to everyone on both the Chess Space server and on live stream. So we're going to go over this again. Okay, so we've got sound now. Everything's set up technically. Fantastic. Okay, so Nigel Short was playing white against Stuart, and he played e4. And we had um, an accelerated uh, dragon defense. Okay, so g6. And after d4, black didn't play c takes. Many of us might be tempted for c takes and play it like a dragon, you know, or something. But, uh, you know, semi open c file pressure. But no, bishop g7. So prompting white to consider d5. We have a kind of Benoni structure. So d5. In the Benoni, uh, you know, you have this kind of structure with d6. Uh, but usually, you know, black's playing e6 and takes later. Uh, and also, this pawn is usually on c4, you know, to be able to recapture back. So knight c3 instead, so it's not really Benoni territory. Bishop g4, as if, you know, black's trying to strengthen control of, of the dark squares in the center of bishop g4. It's a very common move. Uh, for, for black in, in many British Championship games uh, so far, this idea of bishop g4. Bishop e2 and now knight d7. So black's uh, getting, you know, increasing dark square control. After castles, knight gf6. a4 is designed against a6 and b5. If black wants to stretch on the queen side, um, it's going to be difficult. Um, so white just castles now. Sorry, castles, rook e1. Black castled there. Rook e1. And um, now uh, rook b8, as if as if there is an intention of a6 and b5 in any case. So white, although white was trying to restrain, you know, against b5, uh, black's playing for it anyway. So black's got to try and generate counterplay somehow. Um, okay, so h3 getting the light squared bishop because it's got no retreat or anything. It's been blocked, so it's got to take on f3. Obviously, bishop h5, there's g4, actually will be winning a piece. So it takes on f3. Now knight e8. So knight e8 probably has this intention, you know, to, to try and prepare uh, b5, knight c7, a6, and b5. Okay. The bishop goes back now, eyeing b5. You'll notice it's eyeing b5. Uh, it also means if bishop f1, you know, maybe later the f pawn might be useful. Okay, a6, and now the most mysterious rook move, uh, probably you know Nigel Short's played so far in the tournaments. I I, I wonder how many of you, um, well you can see the score sheet actually on the chess base server, um, but anyway, so I'll show you. It's amazing um, this this next move. Um, this next move is surprising. Rook a2 so that kind of means the knight might be able to move uh in in some lines you know the bishop being a problem um what else the knight could also potentially retreat back as well if needed so that the c pawn could be used uh so it's a mysterious move rook a2 but also say the bishop moved uh then there might be queen a1 so it might be useful for the A file later. If black played B5 takes, takes, the A file might be useful. So rook A2 is a very mysterious move. Okay, black plays knight C7. Now white clamps down on B5, um, saying, you know, I'm gonna you know, fracture your pawns. That this, this pawn structure is gonna be fractured now if black really wants to play B5. So A5, and black played b5 anyway. Uh, so a little bit of controversy here. The, here, the, the fractured pawns is compensated by, you know, the b file pressure. And, um, you know, there's pressure on the diagonal, of course. And, you know, may, you know, maybe knight b5 to d4, that sort of stuff. But actually, white plays another very interesting, like, positional move now, uh, which kind of secures, actually, d4 control. Because knight b5 to d4 might be quite interesting. Uh, but this next move, knight b1, means now, okay, the bishop and rook are protecting b2, right? But it also means c3 would protect d4. 
You can imagine against this knight b5 to d4, c3 would protect d4. So it's very positional Karpovian stuff going on in this game so far. So black now plays e6. So we're really transposing into Benoni territory if black gets, you know, e file pressure. Uh, knight d2 coming to c4. That's a nice square with tempo to hit the rook. And that's good in the Benoni positions as well. Takes now on d5. White takes. So if knight takes d5 here, then knight c4 also hits the knight as well as the rook. So knight d5 is out of the question. Um, black actually played knight e5. Okay. Knight e5. Um, now doesn't want to release the tension with knight c4, which you know could you know black could simplify instead. White plays knight f1. Now knight f1 means potentially you know knight e3 and maybe f4, kick the knight first, then knight c4, then gain a tempo. So that's the positional plan. You want to play knight c4, you want to kick the knight first on e5. Uh, black now, Stuart played f5, and indeed this happened. Now there's a slight um, a compensation black gets with f4. Of course, this bishop's hemmed in a bit and of course this diagonal is a bit weakened but you know you want to kick this knight so you can get in knight e3 to c4 so knight d7 uh, but note um, you know d4 uh, you can control that now with this next move c3 so c3 and you've still got this in hand knight e3 to, to c4 also bishop f3 can be used to secure d5 even further Okay, so knight f6, more pressure, protects d5. So white's got a nice bind on the position. Very nice, comfortable binds. e file. Look at this structure. These pawns would be more effective if, if d4, you know, if, if this pawn was on c4, you'd think this d4 control would be more significant. But here, if white can get in knight e3 to c4, we're starting to see a Karpovian type uh, squeeze in the position I think. Um, how can black exert extra pressure on d5? In fact, something like queen a8, far too artificial, just knight e3. I don't, there's, there's nothing to increase the pressure. It's a dark square bishop, not a light square one. Uh, so black just plays this next move, queen d7, um, which doesn't seem to do uh, too, too much. And okay, it's difficult to see what black can really do to generate more counterplay here. Um, is is there a dark side to this b5, this fracturing of, of the pawns? It's, it's sort of as if white's getting rid of black's trump cards systematically before moving on to his own trump cards. Um, you know, the d4 trump card's been removed from black. Uh, the b5 pressure's sort of been removed, um, you know, with this rook a2. Um, and really, you know, this bishop's got some latent power, not just protecting d5, but it means, um, you know, may maybe c6 is going to be useful later if the knight can go there one day uh, with the bishop, you know, supporting that whole diagonal. Um, this rook, you know, is in a nice position. Um, so knight e3, just improving the pieces, improving the pieces again with tempo now, knight c4. Um, not minding a pair of rooks coming off in this position. So rook takes e1. Uh, queen takes e1 because remember the rooks attacks you can't can't win that pawn have to move the rook and now the queen actually humbly goes back here to d1 just to protect d5 okay and you'll note here if white wants to move this knight more aggressively he can now with this maneuver and which actually he chooses to do that now knight a5 so the knight's coming to c6 and you might wonder, this this is a big question um, now, you know, why would the knight be more effective on c6 than c4? Um, well, obviously on c6 it's got striking distance to e7. Um, also, you know, the, these other possibilities don't look so significant, b8 and a7. Um, but there's a more subtle reason, um, as well as e5 control, right? The more subtle reason is that with the knight going uh, to c6, 
you can then play c4, which would reinforce d5, which would mean this bishop's like free. And not only that, with, with that free hand that you've created, uh, you might start improving your other pieces. Okay, so one of the main ideas, I think, is to play c4, with the knight still being quite good on c6. You know, still controls quite a few squares on c6. It's a very interesting decision to swap the c4 square for, you know, for the c6 square. But that's what happens. Now, uh, Stuart's next move seems pseudo-aggressive, h5. Uh, so knight c6, and another seemingly aggressive move is played here, knight e4. But that releases, you know, the pressure a bit off, off d5. Uh, but look, this bishop's not amazing at the moment. Uh, c4 reinforcing d5, which means, you know, maybe the queen is free to move now as well, because d5 is adequately protected by this c4 pawn now. So this these positional plans are interweaving with each other. Um, so gradually strengthening this kind of grip on the position. How does black try and generate counterplay? Now, you might think d4 slightly weakened, but remember that knight is also covering d4 still from, from that c6 location. So bishop d4 is not, not a major issue here, tactically. Um, so bishop f6, which might mean, uh, you know, maybe queen g7, you know, then bishop d4. Maybe that's the idea, because bishop f6 also means, you know, maybe h4, you know, restrain, restrain these pawns a little bit. Uh, rook a3 interesting rook a3 this means actually that say, say queen g7 you know bishop e3 say that did happen you know you could take and you could play bishop e3 because the rook's covering e3 that's useful now i uh, i don't know this is a strange move blitz blitz pro hi blitz pro are, are you still here what do you think about this next move bishop h4 do you think that's not that good it seems to be a de uh, a decentralization move i'm not really sure uh do you think it's a very good move bishop h4 maybe black was doing okay in in this particular position here before this bishop h4 it seems i think black started to go wrong you know it's got a bad feel to it for me bishop h4 because it's taking away you know a nice central bishop in contact with d4 i know if it, with not not much practical because because of the knight on c6 but it doesn't feel uh, totally right to play this bishop h4 move i don't know what you guys think um of this bishop h4 uh and also why it can now um you know improve this bishop for a moment he plays bishop e3 there's no useful discovered check you know discovered attack on the bishop because the rook's protecting e3 anyway and this bishop on e3 covers against bishop f2. So I guess if there was any reason, you know, for bishop e3, it was this, you know, bishop f2 might be dangerous. Uh, or or knight f2. Or knight g3. Okay. So bishop e3 covers f2. Okay, so queen g7, you know, I suppose hitting hitting b2 and, and maybe one day, I don't know, g5 might be a possibility. Um, it, it looks a bit strange. The, the other curiosity, strange curiosity for me about this game, actually, is how amazingly good the career path of, of this rook was. Because remember it went to a2, then it crept to a3, and it's got a fantastic career path ahead of it, potentially, which seems to happen. And you wouldn't have expected that, you know, after rook a2 earlier, for this to happen, and indeed for the seventh rank to be a problem, because of that silly knight on c7, that actually b7 is more painful than usual. But indeed, this, this is happening, and it seems black's not in any position uh, to do anything about this simple rook to the seventh maneuver, very sneakily done via rook a2 to a3 to b3. Uh, so rook b3, and this this dangerous you know pin is is threatened, you know pinning that knight. Okay. Um. Okay, Blitzpo, you fought bishop h4. It seemed pointless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're guessing Stuart didn't know what to do at that time when he played that bishop h4. So Nigel really is improving all his bits. You know, all his bits are starting to be good, aren't they, here? 
uh, really. And D5 is a distant memory being weak. D4 is not weak, really. And there's no knight which is going to go to D4. Uh, so this is looking uh, like strangulation. So knight F6. Okay. Knight F6. Bishop D2. As though there's going to be another pin. Not just one pin with this knight being pinned, but another pin. Bishop C3. Pin the other knight as well. Pin and win. Pin both of the knights. Don't let black have any knight not pinned in this position. Okay, so the knight actually goes back now um, to e4. And in fact, there's another purpose to bishop d2, which is revealed now, that in fact the first pin is also kind of more significant after this next move, bishop a5. Artificial looking move, but rook b7 will be threatening to win the knight. Um, so black is uh, on the defensive now. So he plays rook f8. And now we see a simplification. Bishop takes e4 and queen e2. So what is going on here? Why isn't f4 on? Maybe f4 is not on um, because of g3, I imagine. Because g3 is supported by the rook. So g3 would be forking, I think. I think that's the reason. Forking, unless there's a better move. Let's have a quick look. If rook takes f4, um, is there anything else hanging in this position? There is also uh, simply check or, or just rook b7, but maybe, you know, rook f7. So may, maybe the key thing here is g3. Would you, Blitz Pro, would you agree? g3, was that the idea? Not rook b7 because rook f7. I think g3. So that's why that couldn't be taken. <clears throat> um, so we have a position then where e4 is a bit vulnerable and, and potentially dropping off. In fact, knight e8, it is dropping off. Munch. It's munched. Queen takes e4. So white's a healthy pawn up, it seems. Controlling, you know, this square, this square, this square. Uh, this bishop is about to go back anyway on the long diagonal. This rook's, you know, potentially menacing on these two squares if the queen is not, like, protecting b7. Uh, so king h7. Actually, the bishop didn't go back to c3. It went actually to d2, funny enough. d2. Just protecting f4, maybe. So bishop f6. And now bishop c1. And also to be able to protect b2. So now the rook... Um, you know, we've got enough protectors of b2. Okay, so queen f7. Now rook b8. So what's going on here? There's, there's combined pressure. The team's working well together. The white team of pieces is working well. Uh, weaving, you know, positional strangulation. Now this knight goes to g7, which looks optimistic because of knight f5, which would be a nice, in principle, nice post for the knight in front of that f pawn. Um, so white takes the opportunity to get rid of a pair of rooks though and get rid of now this f5 square. Doesn't want black to have a nice square on f5. Plays g4. Okay, squeezing black. Squeezing even more. Queen c8. And now Okay, queen c8 does put pressure on g4. It's defended against with queen f3. And also, maybe, that you know, one day there might be a threat of f5 and takes one day. But queen b7. And now b3. So making the bishop go along thin air now. The bishop uh, is not doing much. The queen's protecting b3 there. a5. And actually now... Nigel's not afraid to play g takes, not worried at all maybe about knight takes, uh, because maybe f5 and it's blasting the black king to bits, I think, if knight takes. So actually g takes is, is played, but the, the king has got slightly weaker still because of check, you know, that diagonal. And now we see the bishop finally returning to that diagonal with bishop d2 as if it might return to the diagonal, but more importantly maybe... It's also, this pawn is, is slightly vulnerable. Okay, why can't that pawn be munched soon? 
queen d7. Okay, the pawn, there's two pieces which could munch the pawn. Um, but is there a problem over here? There doesn't seem to be. This queen's protecting h3. Uh, maybe I can imagine some counterplay with knight here and here, maybe. So this next move pins. Remember pin and win? Pins that knight, so there's no knight f5s. Maybe this pawn can be taken at leisure. It's a, it's a major obvious target, that pawn. But pin this knight first. Interesting. Uh, now, Stuart offers the exchange of queens. Queen f5, and Nigel takes. And again, he doesn't. he's in no hurry to munch this pawn. He just plays king f2. Where's the pawn going anyway on a5? Finally, now he takes it. Bishop takes a5, two pawns up. Okay, black plays on, though. King e8, now king f3. And the king is finding a nice place in the center now to challenge this knight on f5, potentially. But no, he doesn't play king e4. Nigel now plays b4, undermining black's pawn structure, creating another potential fixed target, d6. So c takes, bishop takes b4. So the knight's kind of tied to defend d6. King e8. Now a very interesting move. Bishop e1. As though maybe, you know, it cuts out, you know, knight h4. So you can just take it off. It, maybe bishop f2. So you can play um, eyeing that line, you can play c5 later, as well as king e4. So maybe that's the next little positional plan here. So king d7, king e4. And after knight h6, bishop f2, we've got c5 nicely prepared. And here actually, Stuart resigns. He's two pawns down and he's faced with things like c5. Uh, it's, it's a pretty horrible position. Um, but I thought it was a little bit of a positional masterpiece, this game. I know it's a bit of a longer game than I normally cover, but, you know, I just wanted to show, um, you know, Nigel Short and Adams, uh, what, how they got to, to um, the leading positions, how they mowed down the other GMs. So let's have a look at this game in overview and summary. So a bit of a positional strangulation from White, uh, with with very nice kind of Nimzovician prophylaxis moves starting with rook a2 quite subtle i don't know how many of us would think about this because this move is the start of controlling d4 because once you can move the knight back and play c3 you're controlling d4 which means if black ever plays b5 you know this stuff isn't going to be as effective if you're controlling d4 so um you know a5 and let black play b5 to try and generate counterplay then you can try and shut down black's trump cards now basically you're going to try and shut them down starting with the d4 square control so a takes and now this knight b1 okay knight b1 you want to play c3 you want to start shutting down black's trump cards and then start improving all your pieces especially that rook on a2 it's amazing how it gets to the seventh rank in this game um, so a positional sort of masterpiece uh, we've witnessed here. Uh, strangulation, uh, getting the rook now and knight improved, uh, securing d5, securing f2, um, and simplifying at the right moment. Tactically in control, rook f4, there's g3. Uh, so e4 is vulnerable. One pawn down. And now, you know, this a5 was doomed, but it was taken at leisure when black had played the move a5. Um, it was taken at leisure. Uh, so first pinning that knight on g7. Um, and it's just nice to see this two pawns up. And again, some more maneuvers, just, just, just to find the maneuvering uh, to win there. So that was a nice game. Uh, from Nigel 2687 so um, who outrating Stuart is 2519 let's have a look at another Nigel short game I've got a selection in my clipboard um, let's look at another okay Hawkins against short let's look at Hawkins against short so Nigel short was black I'm going to flip the board 
Okay. So this is uh, another interesting game. Knight F3 from Hawkins, John Hawkins. Jonathan Hawkins, sorry, John, is it Jonathan Hawkins? I've got Joe here, but this is from ChessGames.com. Joe. Um, okay, D5 from Nigel. And now we see, you know, D5, D4. I, I sometimes dread this position for trying to play interestingly with black. And the interesting thing for me is, you know, Nigel makes this position interesting with this next move, Sigurin Nimzovicin move, knight c6. You know, pressure against the center, peace pressure against d4. Shigurin's system, he, he once beat Kasparov with this. Uh, it was on TV, this, this rapid match. It was a fantastic win against Kasparov uh, with the Shigurin. Uh, c4. And now bishop g4. I think against Kasparov he had played bishop f5, you know. Uh, and then there was like, um, oh no, no, no. I think it was bishop g4, knight e5, bishop f5. It wasn't this exact position. Okay. So Jonathan plays c takes d5. And Nigel simply takes on f3. White takes, so he's got double pawns. He's got the bishop pair in return. Queen takes d5. But black in this position can actually castle queenside quite niftily uh, to put more pressure on d4 and maybe for e5 to be more important. Okay, so white reinforces d4 with this next move e3. And black elegantly castles. So black might have, you know, a nice game here. Knight c3. And that queen h5, the queen's a bit of a pest on h5. And, you know, where would white castle in this position? So, interestingly, white elects to go for the exchange of queens now. Um, he plays actually f4. Um, Blitzpro, what do you think about this position with the queens coming off after queen takes, king takes? White's got the bishop pair. Uh, but you know this 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 fracturing of the pawn structure. Um, I don't know. You know, there's squares, isn't there, for black to try and seize holes of with the knight. Particularly f5 is is usually going to be a, a square to exploit. Um, what do you think? Black's doing okay here. Does everyone think black's doing okay uh, after this exchange of queens? I think I think black's okay. Um, if he can restrain the bishops and the position doesn't get blasted open, then the two, the two bishops, the bishop pair, shouldn't be that effective. Okay. You you like f4. All right, okay. To be honest. Okay. So e6, bishop g2. So, you know, maybe d5 is going to be potentially on the cards. P possibly not. I think, I think the idea is just to keep control of the center. So knight c e7. Yeah, there might have been a positional threat of doubling the pawns actually. And now, you know, black can think about c6 to blunt the bishop on the diagonal as well. So king e2, knight f6, and after bishop d2, knight f5. And look at this. This is a beautiful square, I find, for the knight. Because any e4 is always going to be running into the d4 problem. d4 is under great control here. And Nigel had a nice game in Gibraltar with Shakurin, I was impressed with as well. Um, this is he, he really does play the scoring wonderfully with his knights, I find. So rook h c one. Okay, the king uh might need to move a bit because you know there might be some clear threats. So king b eight, just in case. Uh so knight e four, and now an exchange of knights. And now g six, not minding uh you know bishop f five, because although um you know what white would he, would he want to take on f5 no he's got the bishop pair he's not ready at the moment to give up bishop pair and that would also you know mean of course you know maybe black can take with the g pawn and have g file pressure now he, he likes that bishop on e4 it's eyeing things um he plays a4 and maybe you know a5 a6 just to try and undermine you know the diagonal 
or even just you know potentially if if the bishop wasn't here you know maybe, maybe this sort of thing or b4 b5 okay h6 is played as though maybe you know g5 just undermine this structure you know make make d4 weaker if it takes then d4 is going to be weaker so bishop c3 uh so there's a tactical threat emerging against the rook and the rook another nifty <laughs> rook move from nigel here strange but necessary perhaps rook h7 he's he's amazing with these rook mo moves amazing rook h7 wow so rook d1 knight e7 where's the knight going is it going to d5 now maybe it's gonna it's trying to get control of you know b4 if you can get this to get control of b4 that might be good as well bishop b4 but also the knight moving you know means f5 is possible and actually plays it now f5 not minding white playing bishop e7 um did white have to play bishop e7 well if bishop d3 knight d5 looks like a mighty knight and you know say takes takes that that would be nice for black and if the bishop moved on this diagonal then even so knight d5 looks nice so actually the knight was removed here from white removed that knight I've, i don't think like the look of it coming to d5 that might be one of the main reasons simply so he snapped off the knight and maybe he thought you know opposite color bishops he wouldn't mind a draw against nigel and and you know maybe you know opposite color bishops statistically he's thinking you know will, will, will help secure a draw so how how does black carve out a win in this opposite color bishop scenario the opposite color bishops drawing is just a gross generalization uh though especially with with kind of rooks around and you know structural weaknesses around and exploitable weaknesses around that you can't just say opposite color bishops equals a draw it doesn't work like that chess is far too much uh, complexity has far too much complexity for the for these gross simplifications but how would black you know try and grind out an advantage here well his next move g5 um so he doesn't mind dissolving the pawns because of course he'd have h file pressure so d5 from white tactical kind of response takes and our bishop takes f5 but look at black structure it's kind of intact on both sides of the board intact over here and remember c6 can, can be used to reinforce d5 needed and intact over here so black's eking out something here which he didn't have before he's eking out a much better pawn structure than white and dynamism at the same time after fg hd who's got the pressure the rook has got the pressure white's undoubled pawns fine but the bishop's also got this diagonal target on b2 so there's exploitable targets and weaknesses and dynamism at the same time so h3 now a5 clamping down you know these guys clamping down on b4 and b4 is going to be an important square later for white's downhill collapse as you're about to see make a note of that b4 square so rook ac1 and now the rook elegantly swings with that h fold to h6 so it can come and attack that poor b2 pawn you can see this coordinated effort against that poor b2 pawn on the way because of that sneaky rook h6 so b3 rook b6 rook c3 a bit passive rook b4 so the rook now on b4 is really blockading uh b3 the bishop can't do anything about that rook being on the light square the rook's also helping restrain you know that side of the board and against f4 so there's restraints going on against these two guys and against this one so this one this one and this one quite a lot of positional restraints and can black try and create you know a passed pawn that's the big question which is going to emerge pretty soon how does black intensify the pressure and does he have any past pawn opportunities uh, so rook cd3 c6 now is e4 on the cards here well maybe if e4 black simply plays d4 
because the, the the rook and this one you know that's enough so of course you've got pressure otherwise on d8 um so f3 and then bishop f6 so definitely you know white's e4 you know there's d4 and black's got a lovely e5 score as well so rook g1 and now white's getting you know systematically strangled here um again uh, so rook h8 like in the other Nigel short game so and the thing is for me uh, the interesting thing about this game at move 32 okay the interesting for me is, is how much pressure you can possibly exert with seemingly minimal resources left in the position but look at the torture created now uh even after the rook exchange here, the torture created by this king coming in now to b4. There's a lot of pressure that the king is like a, a slow moving queen. And it can't be dislodged. So that b4 square, vital for black for invasion plans. And the pressure is just increased now. It's increased because black can play for b5 at the appropriate moment. Uh, a few maneuvers now b5 so this is how you know there's going to be more pressure he's going to sp splinter these two and potentially you know then have a4 at his disposal so a b king takes because otherwise if c takes then you know rook takes but now a4 is at the disposal this rook can come in and the rook can potentially come in and the bishop's just very nice on that diagonal at the moment so now the pressure is increased again And the rook and bishop are coordinating very well, but this a4 move is going to come in at some point. The king is being really torture, torture, in torture mode. So d4, e4, d4. The king can now come to invade to b2. Horrible. Check. The eviction doesn't really work out. The king's still lurking around. And Nigel doesn't mind even exchanging off a pair of rooks, even in this scenario, because this d pawn would be huge coming down here. So check king c1. Again, uh, renewing the idea that maybe rook c2 is going to be useful. Check, check, check. Now king b2. After check, the king goes back to a3. So what's going on here? bit of torture so rook d3 now c5 something different c5 and the thing is with c5 it means this bishop is now free to come to f4 because otherwise d4 would have been dropping off but now reinforcing d4 the bishop can come here and control these two squares which means uh we're going to repeat that action that we had before with the king infiltrating on b2 so bishop f7, now bishop f4, putting on the squeeze for the second time, but with more impact this time. Okay, because of that bishop on f4. So king comes to b2 again, but there's no check this time on d2. It's all been ruled out. And now king c2 brutally, brutally uh, forcing a win in this opposite colored bishop scenario. Because the rook must you know exchange off here because if rook d1 check wins a rook so uh white actually resigned here because i think this pawn's winning if takes takes um the pawn is winning these pawns are all restrained this majority of pawns is restrained and all black's going to do is like uh you know king b1 B, sorry b2 and then c2 and then c1 and there's no stopping it so that's total brutality which probably hopefully shatters the illusion to you that you might have had um, about the opposite colored bishops uh, being easy to draw this game demonstrates that's just you know a gross generalization which which many people um, make um, and and this game shows the intense pressure that can be generated even you know with simplified material uh so let's quickly skim through that one it was a bit of another positional kind of 
technique, um, you know, masterpiece from Nigel Short. So after the Queens came off, somehow, you know, he reduced the dynamism of White's pawn structure. He didn't mind the opposite color bishop scenario. And, you know, he had um, kind of this plan of invading with his king, uh, which really worked out wonderfully in this game, uh, putting on the squeeze. And, um, you know, White was a bit of a spectator to Black's plan. You know, Black could inflict the structural changes at leisure, you know, playing for b5, playing for a4. Um, so, but he doesn't need a4, actually. It also demonstrated, you know, he, he just wants to invade with his pieces here. He doesn't need to play a4. Invade with the pieces first. Prompt white to play e4 actually, and then you know, get the bishop to f4 once once d4 is supported with c5. So support d4 with c5, which means bishop f4 is on the cards. Put the squeeze on again until white cracks, and white cracks. White had to resign here. So a positional win, okay. Bit of a contrast from from last week when I went over short wins. <laughs> but this is a bit of a long win for Nigel Short. Okay, so let's have a look at another game. Um, okay, Short against Jones. Uh, now this this is really this is really interesting stuff. Uh, it's really interesting because Nigel Short didn't play one e4, and you know usually he plays one e4, but apparently he had an encounter with Jones. Uh, earlier, I think it was in some European team championship, and he played the English opening then. So we're going to flip the board. He plays the English opening, and he doesn't usually play this. And it's amazing um, how he played it, actually. He made it look really effective, actually. Um, so c5, uh, symmetrical so far. Okay, g3, knight, c6. But now we get uh, a Botvinnik system from black. So black's trying to clamp down here with these two pawns uh, on that d4 square in the Botvinnik system. d3, now knight g e7. And now this, this little move, bishop g5, which isn't such a, uh, it isn't a tempo loss if it causes a committal move like f6, the bishop can just retreat. And you know, that, that diagonal might be weaker once f6 has been played. d5 might be more of a problem. The bishop's hemmed in by its own pawn on f6. So inducing f6, there's a nice little positional subtlety to bear in mind to play this annoying bishop g5. Just induce f6. It's got a few advantages to it. A little finesse. Um, so bishop d2. Okay, so d6. And now white, you know, plays this plan, which I've, I've called like um, damp squid or wet lettuce in, in a game, which I, I, I didn't really get anything against I am... Um, last year's classic, I, you know, this A3, you know, this kind of stuff, B4. But in, in Nigel Short's hands, he makes this plan look really good, actually. Um, that That's the major plan to play for, for B4 here. So he plays for B4. And uh, apparently, you know, Black, actually, instead of this routine castling, uh, apparently Rib Ribka or Houdini was saying, like, Rook C8, and then you play B6, and you should have a kind of secure position. But the way it was played from black, black kind of deteriorated quite badly just by this routine um, casting move, actually. This routine casting move probably makes a huge difference rather than rook c8, because rook c8 takes the rook off this diagonal, you see, which means b6 is possible against b4. So if black's going to routinely castle, he doesn't seem, he seems a bit complacent about this b4 plan in this position. And it was that complacency which drove White's advantage up and up and up. So this was the beginning of the end. Actually, this castling move. <laughs> the beginning of the end. Just castling. Because uh, B4, what does Black do here? Uh, B6 is looking quite risky in this position. Okay, he actually, he takes... Although B6 m might be plausible. I don't know. But uh, actually... Black took, and now off the takes, uh, the idea was to play this central thrust d5. But uh, Nigel's got an interesting um, maneuver now. After b5, the knight's dislodged. 
but uh, not not bad, too bad if it you know comes to f7 later you would think. But c5 is a bit vulnerable here. And now knight a4 comes into that c5 square, threatens to come in to get that precious e6 bishop, knight a4. So that's an interesting moment here, this knight a4. So got Garwin, um, who by the way I drew with in a five minute game recently, I was a bishop up against him and I offered the draw and he accepted. I, I chickened out, by the way, but that was, I, you know, so I played him just, just about two weeks ago in this five minute tournament. I thought I should throw that in. Um, uh, but anyway, coming back to the game, bishop f7, um, bishop b4, and look at white's bishop. So it's a lot of pressure on black's position. Um, rookie eight. Okay, black's a little bit passive. Knight d2, putting a bit of pressure now on d5. And if it takes, there's always knight c5 and you're on b7 um, as well. b6, and now a very simple move highlighting white's grip, white's pressure on d5. He dismantles black's pressure, counter pressure on d5 by just snapping off that knight. So after rook takes e7, knight actually retreats, highlighting this pin on the rook. So horrible pressure on d5. Very awkward to do anything about that pressure because the knights, knight and rook are not that intelligent in this position. That knight on d8 and the rook on, on a8, they're awkwardly placed for this configuration. Beautiful, you know, uh, centralizing move, just putting that pressure on d5. So things sharpen up here now. Um, go and plays e4. Now Nigel takes on d5 seemingly not minding this aggressive continuation of black this e takes d3 but he's got it all sorted because of d6 unleashing uh, an attack on a8 and not minding d takes because he's got this check if needed so takes he plays check okay and then he doesn't mind his rook coming off because in this position it's really difficult for black because the black rook is attacked and white has that c6 square remember that c6 square that bishop can come to c6 so it's difficult because um uh you know rook e1 for example and then bishop c6 so going decided to sack the exchange here with rook e8 exchange for a pawn allowing bishop c6 okay so he's gone the exchange down Okay, can Nigel exploit this? He plays rook a1. The thing is, these pieces are not particularly brilliant at the moment. And this, this pawn's a liability here, this a7 pawn. So it's protected. And now back to the center, rook d1. Queen e8. And now rook c1, threatening maybe, you know, rook c7. And there'll be a nasty pin. Queen d7. And now... A nice little move, knight e3, simply with the idea of knight d5 and maybe rook c7 again. Very difficult to stop. Black, in this position, you know, he hasn't got much control of d5. The minor pieces can't really do much about this knight d5. So Gohan decides, you know, f5, at least trying to secure down c7, because knight d5, now there's bishop e5, trying to, you know, protect c7. So knight d5, bishop e5. But there's a really nasty tactical surprise here, which Nigel plays. Ouch. He plays rook c7 anyway. Oh dear. Because the bishop's overloaded. Look at this knight check against the queen. So bishop takes w knight f6 check, forking these guys. So Gwen's going completely downhill now. Rook c7 anyway. Oh dear. If if Queen d6, you know, there's um there's gonna be something nasty here. There's got to be. I'm not hundred percent sure hundred percent sure what. Um 
Okay, I'll leave that as an exercise unless someone wants to speak up now in this position. What what's the move? Knight f six, there's queen f six protecting f seven. Knight e seven check, maybe the king moves to f eight. I'll met I think knight f six, queen f six, but knight e seven is on you know that's on f seven. So if king f eight I don't know. Someone says knight f six. Okay, look, knight f six, queen takes f six. Yeah. What's the move here, guys? Do you know? If queen d6 had been played, does anyone know? Um. Okay. Uh. <laughs> well, anyway, th there must have been some technical issue with queen d6, and it wasn't played instead. Gwen decides to give up his queen uh, for rook and knight. He plays queen takes c7. Oh, sorry. Someone says rook f7. After queen d6, rook takes f7. Takes. Now what? Knight takes b6? I'm, I'm not really sure that... You know, simply, maybe, as, as someone's pointed out, Maybe just rook takes a7. I mean, why is the exchange up? So you just play this and you just torture black, you know, then, you know, that that looks winning enough. Rook takes a7. Okay. All right. So let's let's skip over that. So queen takes c7, trying to build a fortress. But uh, Nigel's up to breaking the fortress. He wins first the a7 pawn. So black seemingly got this fortress, but is a bit optimistic. Because the king can march in now. The king starts marching in to the black position. Very soon. Check. Now the king's on the way in. Check. King's taking a few steps into the position. G4. There. To protect the pawn. And also if FG, FG, you're attacking this bishop. So you're not losing a pawn or anything. FG, FG, attacking the bishop. Bishop moves. And the king carries on the march into position. Breaking down the fortress. Making way for the F7 square to be used by the king. One day, soon. Very soon, king F6. Threatening queen G7. Check, king F7. And now G6 is on the fire, so that means queen here or here will be on g6 so not much of a fortress hg hg and here um Gwen, he he resigns here it's hopeless uh but you know in in this position i think actually this might be more optimal queen i think it was pointed out in in the live stream uh, you know one of these two would be more optimal don't need to recapture but it's all it's all winning now so that was an interesting uh choice by Nigel short to play the english opening Let's have a quick review of this one then, another positional game. So these positional kind of um, masterpieces from Nigel. And he really impressed me several years back with with positional masterpieces as well. I really like his positional play, actually. And these games are just as wonderful as, as years back, you know, more than 10 years ago, when, when Spillman was still playing in the British Championships. I remember that. And um, actually, I remember Spillman got murdered in about 22 moves by Nigel Short. And um, he was saying he was like a clapped out GM. He was really depressed after losing to Nigel Short so quickly. But Nigel still, he's still got it going. He's just below 2700. But these are positional masterpieces combining with, you know, nice tactical combinations as well. And playing stuff, you know, doesn't have to play E4. He can play all sorts of stuff. He can play the English opening, as this game demonstrates. And so this is really nice stuff. This overloading tactic, rook c7. You could just try and win a7 if nothing else. So if bishop takes, there was knight f6. So then the fortress was just broken down systematically with a king march into black's position. So, um, okay. Uh... 
a nice win another nice win okay maybe um next week we can focus some of adam's uh wins as well uh to balance out looking at nigel short this week but um i don't know we've uh we've done 55 minutes at least so um i hope you enjoyed uh my coverage of these three key games and i'll upload them to youtube pretty soon this commentary if you want to check it out on youtube again or or the library here on 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 chess base where you can resize the board etc while still playing my my uh, vocal commentary so it's more flexible if you, if you become a member here uh, so but if you want to check it out on youtube it'll be there so um if there's any questions i'll be here for, here for the next minute or two two or three minutes otherwise um you know thanks very much hope uh, there was something in these three games that might improve your chess. Thanks very much.